fighter jet on a training run just came ripping over our campsite, which feels particularly fitting since we came out this way specifically to find the wreckage of a fighter jet. What is it about scenes of solemn remembrance? What draws us to places where bad things happened? People of all countries, all races, throughout history have felt compelled to construct memorials and pay tribute not just to those who have died, but those who have undeservedly died before their time. We can discuss that more a little later. This morning, I was driving around on the Christmas Valley dunes at dawn. For now, we've got a chunk of desert to cross on our way to that crash site. just inches of super, super fine ash. It's not like driving in sand and it's not like driving in mud. It's just got this weird consistency and it billows out. And uh, I wanted to show you what it looked like and I ended up with a mouthful of dirt out of that, so. We are headed out through some really remote, wide open desert. Just amazing vistas in every direction. We're actually headed to a sort of historical site, but it's not one that, you know, is pioneer days, a hundred years old, that kind of thing. Nothing but sagebrush, as far as you can see. No trees, just sagebrush. But it smells good out here.
when you think about the deep, lush rainforests uh, of Western Oregon, which really is not that far away, it's really a striking contrast. But I think that's part of what makes it so charming is just that it's so different from home and really not that far out of reach. We're almost at the end of this road, but the final climb is a little too rocky and rutted for the Subaru. It's proving to be a bit of a challenge for Jason's van as well. The remaining mile of this road is closed to motor vehicle traffic, so we'll be hiking the rest of the way. So this airplane, what's left of it, was a US Navy A6 intruder and it crashed out here in 1973 during a nighttime training flight. There's sort of a low area off in the distance there and then there's a ridge line and the pilot came in too low, unable to see the ridge line, impacted it right over there and the plane literally disintegrated. There is debris everywhere out here just for I don't know, at least half a mile, and out in either direction, every place you walk, every place you look, there's a piece of this plane. The entire wreckage was left out here as basically a memorial to the pilot. It's definitely a somber scene amidst all the stunning beauty out here. What is it about standing in a place where someone has met an untimely demise? I think it goes beyond simply paying respects. I think it triggers a far more personal moment of contemplation of one's own inevitable passing. As sentient, conscious beings with an awareness of our own mortality, coming face to face with hard evidence that our time on this beautiful planet could end, really, at any unexpected moment, reminds us to embrace the life we've been given, find ways to relish the time that we have, and appreciate those we love who enrich our lives and make our time here a little more enjoyable. The incredible just vastness of the spread of debris really attests to how violent the impact must have been. I will admit I'm at a little bit of a loss for how to present this. I'm not here to exploit what happened out here. This is just another piece of the history in the Eastern Oregon desert. You find cabins that are 100 years old, you find artifacts that are thousands of years old from Native Americans, people who lived and died out in this vast desert. I can't presume to know the thoughts of the fighter pilot and his navigator who certainly died instantly on impact out here on this remote desert ridgeline. 
but I have to think they assumed they would be back home that night, enjoying moments with the people in their lives they loved and cherished. Sites like this not only pay tribute to the brave souls who perished, but also serve as solemn reminders to savor the moments we have with family and friends who are still with us. Night had fallen by the time we returned to our vehicles. We've had a long day that started before sunrise, so we're just gonna get camp set up, eat something simple, and get some rest. It's a cold, cold morning, and as usual, we're up before dawn, so we've got a fire going while we wait for the sun to get up and join us. Between the rush of arriving late in camp last night and uh, trying to film this beautiful sunrise this morning, I've fallen way behind on charging stuff, so I've gotten everything hooked up to the Jackery, getting everything ready for the rest of the day. The Jackery Explorer 500 not only keeps all my devices charged up, it also powers my fridge overnight. The Jackery itself can charge off the car during the day when we're on the trail, so I've always got all the power I need to keep operating, even on a week-long trip like this. A few days of dry, dusty trails has created a crazy accumulation of dirt everywhere. And while we've only spotted one wild horse so far, too far away to film, there is ample evidence that they frequent this area. asked for a better send-off from our visit to the A6 site. Time to head off across the desert on the next leg of our expedition. Many thanks to Jason for providing drone shots and other footage seen in this episode. On Jason's website, you will find information about the journey we are on, including a GPX download of our route on this trip.